I've been asked to uh, ask you all to take your seats and get ready for the next speaker. While you're sitting down and before introducing the next speaker, I'll, I'll mention on a, a rather somber note that this is a significant day in history. It was on this day in 1862 that at congressional direction, uh, the Navy uh, abolished the rum ration on ships at sea. So we all ought to bow our heads on that one. On a lighter note, as the Secretary mentioned, we've uh, begun fabrication on USS Constellation FFG-62 uh, up in Wisconsin. And uh, Gibson Cox, a lighthouse company, uh, is adapting that design uh, for US use. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor today to introduce our next speaker, Admiral Lauren Selby, who's the Chief of Naval Research. He's a native of Baltimore, Maryland, a graduate of the University of Virginia and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He had a distinguished career in submarines where he commanded USS Greenville, represented the community on the Hill as a congressional liaison, uh, was an acquisition professional, and, um, and was also CO5, the chief engineer of the, of the entire Navy. When you take and add his, his passion uh, and his intelligence, you could not clone a better naval officer to become the chief of naval research. Um, He's best known for uh, his initiative in reimagining naval power. He has his feet in the lab, uh, his heart in the fleet, and his head in the fight. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Lauren Selby, uh, Chief of Naval Research number 26. And I, we should trademark that, or whatever you just said there. It's, wow, okay. Thank you very much, Nevin. Appreciate the invite. Hey, it is awesome to be with all of you. How you doing? All right, good. All right. I'm not the after lunch guy, but you know, you, you kind of wish I was the after lunch guy sometimes, but I'm not, not today. Hey, um, so I am going to talk to you today about reimagining naval power because I am passionate about what I see as a critical need for us to think about the future differently and recognize that the world we live in today is drastically different than even the one we lived in 10 years ago and certainly 40, 50, 60, 80 years ago when we fought Guadalcanal. It is a totally different world. It is very much driven by the pace of technological change that we're feeling in our personal lives. It's, it's pressurizing your phone with the updates that come every day or, or so. Um, it, it is just a, an unrelenting pace of change that really, just to be frank, I think most of us have trouble keeping up with. And again, um, you know, think about your personal life. Think about how you're just constantly bombarded with information, whether it's, uh, whether it's emails or it's, uh, well, it's not phone calls anymore, it's text messages, it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's whatever your social media of choice is. You just can't escape the constant bombardment. And don't get me wrong, I mean, some of it is actually good. I mean, think about all the, the reconnections we've all made with our lives from Facebook and other, other social media platforms. Uh, I think that's a great, that's a great thing. But I also think that we are still, I think, underutilizing a lot of what is out there because we get so overwhelmed by it that we kind of do what we're used to doing and we don't take the next step. And it's mostly because I think we're kind of mentally tired. I mean, I don't know about you guys, I get to the end of my week and I, I, you know, it's, I'm ready for that beer. I'm ready for that, for that weekend. I need to recharge and get ready for the next week. But the problem is you, just, you still can't even escape it on the weekend. It's still kind of there. And you have to make a very conscious effort to unplug if, if, you, if you can do that. Some, some of us can't. You, it's just not in our DNA. So anyway, that's, that, that's what drives me because I really think we're at a pivotal moment in history. I think it's a combination of the technology is obviously a, a key piece of it, especially in my role as a chief of the research. But I think the geopolitical situation that we find ourselves in is, is very um, troubling, I'll just say it that way. I mean, who would have thought even five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, that we'd be sitting here today talking about and seeing on the news siege warfare up close and personal? apartment buildings with the facades ripped off, holes down the center. I mean, who would have thought that? I mean, and again, maybe it was just Pollyannish thinking that, you know, we're, we're past that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not past that, okay? So the time is now for us to really get serious about what we're seeing happen in the Western Pacific before it becomes too late for that. We have got to find ways to obviously strengthen our deterrence, continue to build the capable systems we have today, 
but we also have to start thinking about what's next. So I often talk about references to history. If you go back to the 20, go back 100 years, go back 100 years, the battleship was the premier weapon system for the United States Navy. Everybody thought that the battleships concentrate the battleship force anywhere in the world and you could, you could wipe any other fleet off the planet. That was our strategy going into World War II. That was all the war planning we had with the Imperial Japanese Navy. We would sail west, we would concentrate our forces, and we would annihilate the, the Japanese Navy. And clearly we know what happened on December 7th, and when we woke up on the 8th, we, we knew that the world had changed and we had to have a different strategy. The good news is that in the 20s and 30s, there was a cadre of men and women, mostly, I guess, I guess I'm sorry, sorry ladies, it was really mostly men back in that day, it's just the reality, but it was mostly uh, naval officers that were working, actually not too far from here in Newport, Rhode Island at the War College. They were thinking about different ways of fighting warfare. There was also this cadre of officers that were working on these, these new airplanes that all services were working on, but the Navy was thinking through how can we actually weaponize these with our ships? And we all know 1922, the Langley became our first flat top. We started developing tactics with aviation. Fortunately, there was enough support to allow that to continue, even though the battleship was still the premier weapon system, the primary asset for the United States. We were still working on these aircraft carriers and these airplanes to build a strategy for how you might employ them if they were needed in a fight. We also continued to work on our submarine tactics coming out of World War II. Uh, but again, they had, less, uh, they had less clout than the battleship Navy. And that was just the reality. Look at the senior ranks of the Navy back then, a very, very battleship-centric kind of a Navy, okay? Uh, clearly going into World War II after, after the, the attack on Pearl Harbor, we had aircraft carriers. Thank God they were not in Pearl Harbor on the morning of December 7th. Uh, and we were able to use those to take the fight to the adversary very, very rapidly. And ultimately, we came out of World War II uh, with carrier strike groups as a focal point of our, of our naval power. That was the focal point. Well, I'm here to tell you, here we are, you know, 80 or so years later, and that's still the focal point of naval power. Now, I'm not here to say that, it's, that that's wrong. I don't think it's wrong. I think it's actually, it is a very capable weapon system. It's a very capable platform. I just also know that the adversary, whoever the adversary is, has had decades of time to watch and observe how those platforms operate. And if you don't think that they are thinking through ways to counter them, then you're kidding yourselves. So I contend that it's also time today to begin thinking about a backup plan, what I have been calling a hedge strategy, a hedge against the primary asset being battleships of the day in the 1920s and 30s, today being the carrier strike groups. We need a hedge against that, so we have another asset class that we can have on the table in the event we need it one day. I contend, looking at technology today, that that really consists of autonomous systems and sensors. Uh, and it's a plethora of them that are in the air, on the surface and under sea, some of which uh, may be higher end, like the Sea Hunter that O&R and DARPA put together, uh, that class. It may be things that are uh, very cheap, what I call trittable throwaways, use until they're done kind of things that you can procure in the thousands. So I am looking to find ways to build a machine within the Navy that can experiment at a pace that can actually bring these things to the, to the fore really on like a daily bait. I mean, I wanna be doing stuff in a virtual gaming environment, but I also wanna get stuff wet and dirty with war fighters, scientists, engineers all huddled around observing, but be able to do this all the time, not once a year, not every other year at RIMPAC, not even at an Amte Antex that might happen every six months. I think we need a machine that does this repeatedly all the time. So that's what I'm driving for. And that's that when I talk about reimagining naval power, that's where I'm trying to go to a future that has this backup plan. But it also honors the fact that we have these, these very exquisite, very capable platforms, and we will continue to have those for several decades. And we need to have those. So we have to be able to do kind of two things at once. And so I often talk about this with my hands. So with my right hand on your left, you've got the machine that cranks out the very complex warships, submarines, aircraft carriers, high-end fighters. You have to be able to do that, and you also have to be able to modernize those platforms. 
We have machines that actually do that, and we arguably do that pretty well. And Don gave me, Don McCormick gave me this last week, but we have this, we call this the horse blanket. Many of you know this thing. This is the Integrated Defense Acquisition Technology and Logistics Lifecycle Management System. That is a mouthful, as is this chart. Many would like to poke at this, prod at this. I will, I will contend this actually does what it's designed to do. At the end, at the end of the day, Right, well, you're right, right, but, it may, but milestones are all in here. But arguably, this still does a pretty good job. And if you go back to the 80s and 90s, when you know, Goldwater Nichols and really this system was actually created, it was created to build these exquisite platforms. And it does actually a really good job of that. And we do have, in fact, the, the most exquisite weapon systems on the planet today. You, can, you know that because others are trying to steal our stuff, okay? And that's, I got it. But that does not mean that's the only thing we should be doing. So while we do this modernization and build these complex, very capable systems, we have to have another system that can actually produce more disruptive things, things that are really more of a software, digitally backed kind of backbone, and that is a different model. And we can do that in slices of excellence, but we don't do that at a scale that I think is impactful enough to deter an adversary like China. And that's what I'm trying to figure out how to do. And I think that there's a combination of, we talk about the value of death, we have machines that ideate and create ideas like there's no tomorrow. And you could talk about ONR, AFRL, there's, we do that pretty well. I don't, I don't think we have a problem with that. We have ideas come from the fleet every single day, every single week. We have great ideas everywhere. There's a middle ground here. You take the ideas. You now have to incubate the ideas. You have to mature the ideas. Not all the ideas, but the ones that have, in my case, naval relevance, that have the ability to actually impact the fight. You have to now incubate those, which means you take them, you, you mature them further through the TRL cycle, but you also have to experiment with them. And that experimentation is critical. And that is the experimentation that we need to develop a machine to do really kind of all the time. And once you've experimented and you've got the ones that you think will solve a relevant warfighter problem, you then need to scale and you need to scale up rapidly. That is another place where we don't do, uh, we don't do that very well. Again, there's slices. There's, there's unique circumstances where we're doing something focused on, for instance, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, counter ID. We, we did that actually pretty well. We got a machine going that did that well. But do that more broadly, we don't do that as well. We need to figure out how to do that. And those are the things that I'm trying to do to get after that, okay? Um, all right, so I've realized I've talked here without even using a slide yet, which is, which is standard. But the, the, way this, the way this works for me ONR was established in 1946. Public Law 588 established this law. President Truman signed it uh, August 1st, 1946. Uh, obviously 70, 76 years old this year. Uh, really here looking at the future of naval power. What are the technology we should be working on to actually continue to keep our warfighters really with an unfair advantage over the adversary? And we've been doing that since 46. Uh, another part of the enterprise here, so the left-hand side of this, is where you see the ONR logo on top. The left hand side here of the dotted line is the Naval Research Enterprise. So that consists of ONR, Naval Research Laboratory, ONR Global, Naval X now, and PMR 51. Uh, ONR Global has also been around 40, since 46. It's my international arm, offices all over the world, usually at consulates or embassies, working very closely with universities and government agencies in those company, countries to ensure we're kind of at the uh, we're sharing with them, and we're also learning what they are learning from that part of the world. And more importantly today, we're looking at what other countries are doing in that part of the world. That's a critical part of our uh, being able to keep tabs on what others are doing. The right-hand side of this is the Naval Research and Development Establishment, NRNDE, that consists of all the warfare centers, all of the FFRDCs for us CNA, also the UARCs. So the Navy has five university-affiliated research centers, they're all there. And then you can also see the Naval Postgraduate Schools on here. So that's a critical part of this, the entire team. The entire thing together is the NRNDE, okay? Uh, NRNDE it's, itself, there's really, uh, we're loosely coupled. There's like no, there's no, there's no single leader of the whole thing because they're on different syscoms, but we are, we are loosely coupled. Daz and RDT and e, Brett Seidel, and I actually lead a, a team uh, that gets together at leadership level to discuss common issues, common objectives, uh, and we actually had a great meeting about a month ago in, uh, in my headquarters 
we got the whole team together for the first time in a couple years since COVID. So it was really a great chance to reconnect with everybody. This is kind of who we are, mostly civilians, about 10% military if you can find the, the reserve components, and about 10% contractors. You can see the demographics there. Um, mostly have either PhDs or masters, and then everybody else mostly, mostly uh, college grads, a few technicians, but it's really mostly college graduates. Okay, so, so here's one of my favorite quotes, Admiral Nimitz. So he said this in, uh, after, after the war when he was actually the CNO. And you can see behind him, he had this amazing battle fleet. Coming out of World War II, we had the largest fleet on the planet, uh, you know, many orders of magnitude beyond what the rest of the world combined had. Uh, and he, even at that point in time, saw the future as something that was different. And again, I think that's kind of where we are today. I really do. I've already kind of talked about this. The world is drastically different, changing very rapidly, whether it's siege warfare, climate change, uh, and just the pace of technological revolution that we're facing. Uh, we've got to figure out a ways to look at this differently. And that's why I ask the question, is that enough for where we stand today? And I contend we need to be thinking about something to augment this. It's not enough by itself. How do we do that? Well, again, we bring scientists, engineers together with warfighters. And we make sure the warfighters are, are aware of what we're doing. And we're very conscious of what the warfighters are doing. One of the things that I'm also trying to do is change the conversation to be less about requirements and more about problems to be solved. So what is the true problem that the warfighter has that we can go try to find a way to solve? If you come in with a requirement, you've already constrained the solution space. So again, I'm not say, suggesting that we don't need requirements for very complex warships, we do. There's a reason we, we have the process we have to get after that, but we need to think differently about other kind of what I would call more digital software-based systems uh, or problems, because uh, I think it's different. If you, if you come up with a requirement for something that changes you know, five times in five years, it's probably gonna be really hard to keep up. If I'm trying to solve a problem, it's a different mindset, it opens a different solution space. Obviously, infusing technology is critical. This is where you get into the discussion about the valley of death. Um, again, I think the valley of death is, is less about the ideation side of the house. It's really about the scaling side. So if you think about a bridge, and let's just say on, on this side, you've got the ideas being generated. When you come out of an S&T organization, just by definition, you're, you're gonna be at about TRL level five or so, maybe, maybe six if you're lucky. But that's just because of the nature of the funding you have. To get it across the bridge, you have to mature it beyond TRL five. And that takes different types of money, 6.4, 6.5, and integrate into a system, probably 6.7, kind of already feeding money and just R&D money parlance. Um, and that money, the way we do this is, I've got 6.123, and all the PEOs and all the high nines have the rest of the R&D accounts. And so we have to, it's like a very delicate dance of coordination that has to happen between the left side of the bridge and the right side. So it's the left side with a, with a couple single digit owners, the right side with 20 some odd owners. And you've got to kind of marry these together. And that, that takes a lot of networking, a lot of nuancing. Um, it also takes, I think, experimentation. And again, I think that's that middle ground. That if you could do this repeatedly, I think you could actually move the tech faster. And not everything's gonna move across. And that's, that's critical too. You don't want, I want stuff to fall into the valley because it, not, not everything should go across. Some of it should go back to the beginning and some of it should just go to the bottom of the valley and stay there. Uh, but we need to figure out a way to do that faster. Obviously, disrupting is, is what I'm trying to do. Uh, you heard the secretary talk about trying to keep the adversary off balance. And I think that's critical. Um, and again, it, I just don't know that we can try to match, let's say, China, ship for ship. I mean, they're cranking out ships at a pace that, that I, don't, I don't think we could keep up with, at least not today. But I don't, also don't think that's the point. I don't think we need to keep up there. I think there's different ways to disrupt that without going ship for ship. And that is also a part of reimagining the future, reimagining naval power that I'm going after. So a couple of things that I'm going after to also try to disrupt is something I call decision superiority. So decision superiority uh, in its you know, kind of early ruminations on the idea, I talked about the OODA loop. 
right? So the observed part is, is really your sensors, how you sense the environment. Then you have to orient yourself to kind of what, what's going on around you, space, time, understand where you are, what your, what your potential options could be. Then you have to decide what you're gonna do, and then you take an action. So if you think about the power of AI and what this can do for us if we harness it the right way, you still need to sense the environment. But when you think about the OODA loop, you're always, you're always kind of in a, it's a behind, you're shooting behind the duck because by the time you've observed, oriented, decided, and acted, there's time that's elapsed. If you can actually use AI to take the sensed data and now predict what the adversary, what the opponent could do and probabilistic, probabilistically will do, and then you can make recommendations on that action. And then the human gets to vote and say, yeah, I agree or disagree. And then if you agree at machine speed, machine to machine, the action takes place. I think you shorten that time. I think you, short, you shorten that temporal time between observing and acting. So I don't think OODA is any, it's really not the right reference. It's, it's probably, a, yeah, I mean, maybe there's a different acronym that comes out, I don't know. I'll ask Nevin to work on that one. But, but, I, but I think it's a different model here. And again, if you think about the power of observing, let's just, let's just say you're observing how a company responds to market pressures, to inflation, to different patterns of buying. We can actually today, using, using AI tools, we do that already. In fact, Amazon does that to give you recommendations on what to buy based on observing your patterns. So if you can do the same thing with an adversary on the battlefield and you can observe him over him or her over a long enough period of time, you can start predicting what that adversary is going to do based upon other perturbations to the, to the system, to the, to the battlefield. And if you can use that way to help speed up that process, and again, you have, you have, you know, it'll give you a, a confidence level of what this prediction is. If the human can then come in and vote on that, you can get to an action, I think, faster than the tr traditional way you do it today. And, and that's, that's what this is actually going after. So that's what, when you hear decision superiority, it, this is going to be an INP starting next year. Uh, we're, we're doing a seedling effort right now. Dr. Peter Squire is my lead for this. And I think Peter was, Peter was at Newick yesterday, Ron, with your team talking about some of this stuff. But that's one of the big things I'm working on here to try to get after this kind of cognitive warfare. How do we, how do we speed this process up and still maintain, you know, both, uh, you know, ethically, you know, humans in the loop still making decisions, as well as have confidence levels to understand what the confidence of the different predictions are. Uh, point defense still continues to be a huge focus area. Uh, there's a lot of efforts right now in directed energy, as you're well aware. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with lasers and other directed energy weapons. But again, we still need to protect the, the assets we've got today, and that's a critically important mission set. Uh, we can't just rely upon uh, the missile systems that we've got right now. We need, we need to augment that so we have enough capacity to uh, use those weapon systems for offensive purposes or deterrent purposes, vice defensive purposes, and we're trying to get after that. Um, AI in general, there's, there's more AI efforts than just decision superiority. The secretary mentioned some of that. How do we use machine learning to help us be more uh, predictive in our maintenance? So instead of doing maintenance every six months just because that's the tr statistical average for the entire class of valves or pumps or motors in the fleet, let's do it when that machine needs it based upon observing how it operates, comparing it to uh, you know, a physics-based model that, that knows what, uh, you know, the frictionless plane would be per se, compares the two and then tells you when you need to do, do an action uh, to ensure it can maintain maximum availability for the operator. And then one of the things I'm, I'm doing is a project I call Scout. And so to get after some of these ideas for trying to experiment, move technology faster, bring the warfighters in, be a problem-focused vice requirements driven, I started something called Scout. So back in April of 21, I had a team that uh, basically did an offsite, and we came up with an idea to work with Giant of South, Key West, to help them do their, their mission, which is to find illegal drugs coming into the country, coming in other parts of Central and South America. And so we're working closely with them. We've sent teams down. We've defined the problem space. And so we now have a team that's actually working with industry. We did a commercial solutions opening uh, late uh, last year. 
Uh, had over 100 companies come in with some amazing ideas. We down-selected that to about 80. We've been doing a series of sprints over the last four months with these companies, down-selecting even further. And we're going to do an actual demo sometime early next year, bringing these companies and their kit together with warfighters to go find drug runners. And again, we're making this less about the device or the thing, and it's really more about the data that the device provides, and then the analytics on the back end that massage the data and finds the, you know, the ship that doesn't fit in, the thing that doesn't look like a fishing boat or a merchant, and use this to actually vector in Coast Guard assets to do takedowns. And that's something we're trying to do. And again, I'm trying to exercise the entire process of moving technology across the bridge, providing an experimentation machine that does this repeatedly. And then on the right side of this, when we find things at work, showing that we need to scale those up to actually put things in the hands of warfighters at a pace that we've just not been able to do up until this point. Can't do any of this without your people, so I've got a lot of focus areas here, but the top left one is, is one of the most important for me. I had a great conversation this morning with uh, one of your colleagues here about STEM and STEM talent. Uh, we have a tremendous challenge in this country of providing enough bachelor's, master's, PhD students that are U.S. citizens in the STEM fields. Uh, we need to really up the game there. So I'm also the Naval STEM executive, so I work for the secretary in that role, uh, providing STEM programs, everything from uh, summer internships, scholarships, work with R&E on some of the smart, smart scholarship programs they've got that, that pay for advanced degrees and then provide a payback where they would come to work for, for us in a warfare center or a laboratory. Uh, those are critically important to me. I'm trying to cast as wide and as I can, so we're engaging with a lot of the HBCUs and MSI schools to try to reach a more diverse crowd of folks, uh, get them interested. One thing I find, though, is it's really it's folks like yourselves in this room that either host or sponsor things like robotics competitions, seat perch competitions, uh, and really more importantly, provide opportunities for your employees to mentor students, uh, particularly kids that are kind of in that middle high school transition. We're seeing that there's like a, just like there's an S&T value of death, there's a value of death where kids who are really interested in STEM, whether they're in elementary and maybe beginning of middle school, kind of fall out somewhere in middle to high school because either it's not cool, they get kitted, and really more, the thing we're really seeing is it's because a lot of them don't have someone that looks like them in a senior position that's, that's actually someone that to, to model, to want to be like, and that would hopefully mentor them as well. And so we're really trying to encourage that uh, to try to build more STEM talent. And again, I'm not trying to convince some kid who's supposed to be an English major or a music major to be a STEM major. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I think we'll find there's many kids who start out with a propensity for this who just, again, because they don't have mentoring or they don't see someone that looks like them, they kind of fall, you know, they fall out of the STEM track. And we're trying to, trying to find ways to capture that, bring them back on board. Uh, yeah, I took Derek ahead of my slide once again. Okay, so here we go. Another close out with another Nimitz quote. So again, you know, the Admiral knew that we were always going to need, need a Navy, and I, I, we, we definitely were always going to need a Navy. But does it have to look like it does today? And I think the same question was being asked in the 20s and 30s. And I think we answered, the answer with them was, as today, the answer is no. I think we, we all know that progression of technology is a part of our lives. And, uh, you know, most people don't have horse and carriages in the barn anymore. We have vehicles, and I just think it's the same, it's a natural progression that we're seeing technology take, and, and we just need to you know, ride the wave as it were, in some cases, lead the wave. Okay, that's it, it's my walk off. Now I wanna take your questions. All right, 